folks, you are going to get started in just a minute. Good afternoon. Let's get started. Our speaker next week is James Wesley, who is a professor and chair of Department of Architecture at the University of Washington at Milwaukee. He'll talk to us about carbon neutral design. A couple weeks ago, we had a terrific speaker from Stanford, and we thought we'll balance the West Coast and East Coast, and so we have a very, very special speaker today from the East Coast from Harvard, Professor William Hogan. Professor Hogan is the Raymond Planck Professor of Global Energy Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's also the research director of the Harvard Electricity Policy Group. Before joining Harvard, Bill was on the faculty of Stanford where he, where he started the Energy Modeling Forum, which I imagine most of you probably know either directly or indirectly. If you, if you see in any serious journal, if you see all the charts with various scenarios and you know, different, different energy sources or different uh, uh, carbon futures and so on, in some way or the other, uh, that was done by a serious modeling group that is associated with the Energy Modeling Forum. It, it has become over time the most important convening and coordinating body for most important uh, energy groups, energy modeling groups uh, across the world. Uh, Bill has a very long list of honors and awards, which I'm not going to go through, but I'll just mention that he has been in the past uh, the president of the International Association of uh, Energy Economics. His research uh, combines is at the intersection of energy economics uh, and public policy with an emphasis on uh, restructuring of electricity markets. He is a man, I followed his work closely, he's a man of grand ideas, vision, but in very fundamental ways. And, and so it's not surprising to see that he has left a very critical mark in the restructuring of some of the most important electricity markets across the world, including England, Australia, and uh, increasingly the Texas market here uh, in, in uh, ERCOT. Last year, I hosted Bill for an open Texas uh, uh, PUC meeting where some of these ideas were actually, which you know, Bill actually started working about a decade ago. Say again, Carson? Yeah. Uh, he, you know, he, uh, started some of those, the dis public discussion started last January, and this talk in many ways is actually a continuation of that. Uh, it has already led to some rule changes, important rule changes in the cut market, which are actually in the process of getting implemented. So I'll, with that, I'll leave it to Bill to continue the talk. Thank you, Bill. Thanks so much. How's that? That might better. <laughs> if it's too loud, let me know. So it's a great honor to be back here in uh, Austin at the University of Texas and to have a chance to continue this conversation about uh, scarcity pricing and resource adequacy. Um, and I'm going to, first I preface it by saying, as I am required to say every place I go, I do not speak on behalf of the Harvard Electricity Policy Group. So I only speak on behalf of Bill Hogan, and I'm going to tell you what my views are about these matters. Um, the Harvard Electricity Policy Group, by design, doesn't speak at all, so it doesn't take positions on anything, and that's a very important part of its uh, organization. Uh, the, the topic today that I, that I uh, was asked or elected to uh, come and talk about as part of a very active conversation that's going on here in Texas and ERCOT and with the Public Utilities Commission. And uh, I think it's interesting uh, both for those who are uh, immersed in the details like me um, and, uh, and also for those who are generally interested in this problem but uh, don't, aren't, aren't immersed in the details. Uh, for those uh, who are, are generally interested but not immersed in the details, let me say what I, what I think is interesting about it, is it's an example of this process of trying to think through a complicated issue uh, in a market and to do it uh, in a way that reflects uh, the fundamentals, uh, first principles, uh, that tries to address the political economy um, that tries to address the practical realities of uh, limitations on things like software, um, that tries to find something that's uh, kind of in the sweet spot that uh, balances all of these things. Nothing's ever perfect uh, in, 
anything. Uh, but this is an, an area where this conversation is going on. Um, and it's very important for Texas, uh, and, and it's an, so it's an interesting example of this public policy process in the making. And it is in the making. So as you will see as I get uh, particularly towards the end, well, I'm going to be talking about some speculative ideas uh, which are not resolved. Um, and they're going to be resolved by John Dumas here. He's got it all sorted out for her cut, and he's going to handle this so we don't have to worry. Uh, but uh, this, this is not um, a cookie cutter story where everything is already resolved and I'm just sort of laying out the history of how we got here. This is real time. We're talking about uh, issues that uh, people are trying to discuss and debate. Uh, and then I'm going to get, for the, be for the benefit of the Wonks, I'm going to get in a little bit into the detail here towards the end uh, uh, because I think it's actually important uh, given the choices that are in front of the commission and in front of the stakeholders here um, who have been so actively involved in this conversation. So the broad topic is uh, electricity scarcity pricing and resource adequacy. And um, uh, scarcity pricing is, refers to uh, what do you do? I mean, most of the time everything's working fine and, and uh, uh, life is simple. Um, and uh, then uh, every once in a while, the system gets constrained and things get really tight, and then it gets very interesting. And, and what happens during when the system gets constrained and tight is extremely important. Uh, and th this is the scarcity uh, pricing story that we're concerned about. And resource adequacy is a term of art uh, from uh, the electricity industry. And uh, it goes by slightly different definitions, but it's generally thought of as kind of a long-term standard or goal uh, to make sure that we have enough investment in the resources that we need so that they will be adequate to meet um, the load that we expect to have under uncertain conditions uh, without having things really bad happen without being too expensive. You know, so the, now the formal definition is a little tighter than that, but that's the, the basic idea. Every once in a while we might have a problem where we have to do some involuntary curtailment of load, but we would like to avoid that and have it not happen very often. And we'd like to make sure that there's enough investment in this industry so that that's going to be true as opposed to underinvesting and then always, you know, having to have rolling blackouts going all through all the time. We don't want to have that uh, kind of situation. And um, when electricity restru restructuring came along uh, and we were talking about what to do, um, the, the basic story that evolved was that uh, generation in particular, uh, but maybe retail supply as well, uh, were the kinds of markets or kinds of systems where the old arguments about natural monopoly, that you can only have one entity providing whatever it is that you can provide, uh, weren't true anymore. Uh, and that because of changes in technology and maturity of the grid, perhaps, and so on, we could imagine having a market, having competition, where generators were competing with each other to sell to customers and uh, dealing with um, those uh, customers in markets to create efficient uh, solutions, to allow for innovation through entry, to do, do all kinds of good things, um, and to change the allocation of risk so that people were basically taking risk with their own money rather than other people's money. Uh, one of the problems of regulation always is that the regulator uh, is forced into a situation where they're trying to decide what to do and it's expensive and then they spread the cost across everybody in a room. And then everybody in the room says, I didn't want to do this. You know, I didn't, why are you doing this to me? Uh, whereas in a market, it's more that you get to a situation where it's voluntary interaction and people are taking on responsibilities that they uh, can and will uh, pay for. So we were enamored with this idea of competitive markets. We had seen it work in airlines. We had seen it work in trucks. We had seen it work in railroads. We had seen it work in natural gas pipelines. We had seen it, it was all over the place. And we saw the benefits uh, in all of those. And it became clear that the next thing was going to be electricity. And uh, in fact, it started up in the 80s in Chile, uh, in the late 80s in, uh, in the UK and then in the United States in the 90s and Australia and now it's all over the world, various places uh, doing and changing and reforming these markets. And the, the conceptual framework uh, that we adopted is this uh, picture that's on uh, the screen here. Um, this is uh, from Economics 101 and the conceptual framework was that when you get into the very short run and incidentally I'm going to spend, I'm, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the short-run, real-time uh, situation. I should say as an aside that 
uh, it took a while for people to recognize that um, most of the rules and most of the conventions that had developed under the old monopoly electricity system about how you scheduled and how you handled capacity and energy and everything, most of those rules uh, could be explained as rules in order to constrain people so that they didn't do bad things to exploit the bad design we have in the real time. Um, because we had a bad design for how we were going to operate the system in real time. And uh, so what happened uh, as people started thinking about this is we started to focus on the real time. How could we get that right? Uh, and then if we could get that right, a lot of other things would work better, and then we could have forward markets and do other kinds of things that would go with it. There's another part of the story that I'm not going to talk about, uh, which I've talked about a lot in the past, and I'm happy to talk about it for three or four hours at the drop of a hat if you just ask me, but, um, and that is the problem of the transmission grid uh, and uh, power flows on the transmission grid and the complex interactions. And let me just say that um, that is a real problem, and that was the most important problem we had to deal with in electricity because that's what makes electricity different than natural gas and different than lots of other uh, industries, why we, why we have an ERCOT and a system operator is because of those problems. We know how to deal with that. Texas is doing it the right way. It's not controversial anymore, um, and uh, I'm not going to talk about that. So uh, what I'm going to do is talk about something else, which is this uh, scarcity problem. And the idea with this graphic, which inside this is this graphic was actually used by me and my colleagues when we were having this conversation with national uh, with the Central Electric Generating Board in the UK back in 1989. So this is an old picture, and I, I took the pounds off and changed it to uh, 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 cents per kilowatt hour, but uh, it used to be in pounds per uh, uh, kilowatt hour. Uh, and uh, it's the same graphic. And the idea was is that you take the uh, generation system here and you've got um, cheap generators over here, maybe nukes or coal. Uh, uh, we didn't have uh, free wind and uh, solar in the short run, but you, the, the variable operating cost of that plant is pretty small, so you should use that first. Um, and then you go up the stack, as it's called, and you stack up, and you go all the way up, and you just stack them up in the order of the cost of running them, basically. And then the economic thing to do is to take the cheapest stuff first. So that's called economic dispatch. Um, and there was nothing new about that that was already going on. It was uh, well understood by the engineers. The problem's more complicated on the grid when you deal with all the other uh, essence of the system. Uh, but the same principles apply, and you can apply it uh, in the network. The innovation that came along with electricity market reform was this idea that uh, during uh, early hours of the day when demand, which is the, uh, the, the blue line is the supply and the red dotted line is the demand, when demand is low, uh, then the market clearing price where demand and supply intersect is going to be this low price. Um, and during the day, later in the day, it'll go up, and we'll have a market clearing price up here. And then and, and in the evening, when you're really running out of capacity, the price will be high. Uh, and that a price will apply to everything. And the nuclear plant that's running all the time will capture that whole area. Uh, and that'll go to pay the fixed cost of building the plant, and the same thing for the coal plants and everything. And we were going to march through from this economic 101 story into economist heaven and everything was going to work perfectly. And so we'd get all the investment that we needed because we would have the sufficient pricing. The pricing systems that existed before were just awful, and I won't even go through them, but they were not this. But the, so the big difference associated with the um, reforms was mostly not about how you operate the system, but rather how you price what you're doing when you're operating the system, and that was the, uh, the key innovation. And uh, the assumption that we made back then was we're going to get uh, demand uh, participation in this. They're going to start bidding into the market, and this picture is going to become reality. Um, it gets more complicated when you put it in the transmission grid, but the same principles apply. And what actually happened after a while is that we observed uh, a number of things. One thing we observed is the red lines didn't show up. So we didn't get the demand participation uh, coming in and bidding into this marketplace. They just came in as, I want this much. Okay, so there was no price relationship, and if the price gets higher, I want less. Uh, and there are institutional reasons for that and historical reasons for that, but that's the reality. We didn't get that demand participation. Uh, 
Second is that we had a rule that was developed uh, through this, that actually falls out of the software, kind of a software uh, characteristic, which in the event of um, not getting demand participation, the software, when it's trying to figure out this market clearing price, um, knows what to do here because when, that's, when the demand is Q1, uh, quantity one there, well, you just go up to where it hits the blue curve and that tells you the price, that's not a problem. And when it's Q2, it just goes up to Q here, and it tells you what the price is, that's not a problem. When you get out here to Q max and you go up and it hits the curve there, you have a problem because the variable cost of the last plant that's running might be quite low. Uh, we don't have this demand side participation to tell us that the price should actually be there rather than there. And what actually happened was the software produced the lower price. And this is the emblematic of a problem that e evolved. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a whole list of other things that happened that, that uh, system operators did that had the tendency to reduce the actual prices in the marketplace. And what we discovered after uh, a while is we had this problem which Roy Schenker labored, labeled the missing money problem. Because we had to get the, the prices up to this level during the scarcity to generate enough capital payments to pay for that last plant. If you're only paying for the variable cost of the last plant that's running, then you never have any capital contribution and you can't get it built and now you don't get enough built and now you don't have enough and, and blah, blah, blah. So you go into this missing money problem. And the picture that I've drawn there is uh, I put on there for historical reasons because this is the actual chart that we use, but it does have the deficiency as it's not drawn to scale. Um, uh, and in particular, it turns out the missing money problem was a big problem, not a small problem. So if you, I didn't bring the numbers with me, but you can look at this if you want. So in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, PJM system, they've been documenting this, and the number was for the last 11 years uh, was on average that you were only making half the amount of money that you needed to justify building a new peaking plant. So it wasn't like 93% and it was a little bit off. It was like half. And so it seemed, uh, this is a problem. Uh, when you, it's a, and you couldn't get people to, uh, to build these plants and you didn't have the scarcity pricing to get the demand participation. And uh, so this became a, a matter of concern and there's been a lot of work uh, to try to fix it because it has all kinds of implications. Uh, so it, uh, it screws up investment incentives, this uh, improper scarcity pricing. Um, it creates a chicken and an egg problem with the demand response, which is if you're always keeping the price low, there's no point for the demand to figure out how to bid in in order to reduce its demand when prices are high because they're never going to be high. So you don't get them and so then you don't ever find out that the prices are high and so you can't get that dynamic going. Uh, it becomes especially problematic when you're dealing with intermittent renewable energy because you've got all this variation going on and this volatility in the system, but you're not reflecting those costs uh, properly in the system. It even impacts transmission pricing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a real problem for a lot of reasons and something that we ought to fix. Um, and the conversation that's been going on here in Texas and, and has gone on elsewhere, but it's most especially been going on here in the last year or so or, or a couple of years in Texas, um, is different than other places. Uh, most other places that uh, when they confronted this problem, um, New York, uh, PJM, uh, the Midwest ISO, the New England ISO, uh, and, they, and particularly the three in the East, uh, when they confronted this problem, they said, well, the problem is scarcity pricing. We're not doing real-time pricing correctly. Um, and then the next paragraph is, says in the document, as I was reading these things, they said, uh, that's too hard to fix, so I have to do something else. And then they go around and look around for something else. And the something else that people came up with all the time was capacity markets. And um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about capacity market ideas. That's being debated heavily here in Texas. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but my reaction to this process early on was that capacity markets were not uh, going to be very successful in dealing with this problem. And why don't you just fix the scarcity pricing problem? It's not that hard. Uh, but what I did observe was that uh, in all of these studies, of which there were many, um, nobody ever got past that second paragraph. They just said, well, that's the problem, but it's too hard to fix, and they didn't, uh, didn't uh, think this through. And now it seems like a long time ago, I was called by uh, my friend Yakut Mansour, who then was the uh, chief executive officer of the California Independent System Operator, the counterpart to ERCOT in California. Uh, 
And he said they were confronting this problem and what were they going to do. And I said, well, look, I'm, I'll be happy to come out and talk to with, with you and your staff about this, but uh, here's the deal I want uh, from you. I said, I want you to get the best system operators you have and your economists and everybody and you and me in a room, and I want you to lock the door. And then uh, nobody can leave until we come up with a scheme for figuring how to, how to fix the scarcity pricing problem. Uh, to see if we could actually flesh out the details. What would this look like? And how would this actually work? Because nobody had been able to figure out how to do this. They just, you know, just because it was, it, they were paralyzed by the notion that prices would have to go up and therefore we couldn't talk about it. So you could said yes. And we went into the meeting and it started out, everybody said, this is crazy. It's not going to work. You know, we're not going to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. And now what I'm going to describe is the result after two days where the system operators, which was my test, they said, well, you know, if we could get that, that might work. Okay, so, uh, and then they, we had, a, we had a vote at the end of the meeting, who was gonna go out and explain it to the rest of the world, and they said, you're the only one who's got tenure. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was elected uh, to go out and explain it. And the idea, the idea is the following. We already had, uh, and now I'm gonna really simplify, but we have energy demand, let's say, uh, and it's fixed. And I'm going to say the, that uh, $10,000 is the value of lost load for the purpose of this uh, situation. So if you actually charge people $10,000, they would turn off their lights and they would shut down their house and so forth. $10,000 a megawatt hour, that's a lot. That's, uh, 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 that's $10 a kilowatt hour, so, uh, as opposed to 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So this is a big deal. Um, and uh, uh, we have, in addition to that demand, we've always operated the system with operating reserves. Now, operating reserves are not the same thing as long-term capacity and so on. This is what we have now. I mean, we're sitting here now and we're looking for the next hour or so. We have plant that's spinning or standing by that could be brought online in 30 minutes. Um, if something bad happens and we can get it, then it could be generating energy now, but it's not. We don't. We just have it there running, and it's re, it, it's in reserve and it's waiting. And that was always true. We knew that that wasn't a big deal, and we thought, well, that just kind of shifts the curve out a little bit, takes some of the stuff off that's not generating energy. The demand side will set the price anyhow, so we don't have to worry about that. We haven't done a good job of describing this operating reserve story. We just take a fixed requirement for operating reserves which for the purpose of this picture, I'm saying is uh, 3%, okay? And then the, the, the point of the conversation we had with the Cal ISO is to say, well, you know, now suppose I could get one more uh, unit of operating reserves above 3%. Would, would that be worth nothing? And the answer was, well, no, no that'd be worth something. I mean, it, would, it, would be, it wouldn't be worth as much as the 3%, but it would be worth something. Uh, if I get down below 3% incidentally, I've got a contingency constraint problem, which means I'm going to start rolling blackouts in order to get the reserves back. Because if I don't, then when something bad happens, we'll get a cascading failure, and I need to have that reserve for, to prevent cascading failures in the system. But if I could get a little bit more, I'd be willing to pay something because there's some chance that over the next hour we'll get into that situation. Um, and uh, so, uh, so it, would, it would have some value, but eventually it would, it would go down, and I just drew a straight line there and said, you know, get to 7% before it goes down something close to zero. But the idea was that the, the, we should not have what in economist terms is a vertical demand curve for operating reserves. We should have a sloped demand curve for operating That was the big innovation, you know, so be sloped as opposed to vertical. And if you had that kind of a situation and you represented it explicitly, uh, you would get the following uh, outcome, and here it's on, on the left, is in normal operating periods, you'd have the regular demand, and then you'd have this demand for capacity in the operating reserves, and it would shift over to the right on the supply curve, but it wouldn't have much effect. You know, it would be a little bit, but not very much. Uh, but when the system got really tight, you'd get the situation where the, op the difference between where the normal demand intercepts there at that low price and where the operating reserve uh, intersects would be at a very high price. You get scarcity pricing because of the operating reserve. So the operating reserve command, in, in effect, performs the same kind of function as the bid participation of demand if it would participate. And you could get scarcity pricing. And that joint optimization of energy would produce high prices for energy and capacity uh, during uh, scarcity pricing and market clearing. So this was the conceptual idea. Uh, and then uh, the issue was, how we go about doing this in a way that makes sense. Um, 
But this is the picture that well, when I got finished uh, at the end of the two days, the operator says, you know, if we could get that, that might actually work. That might give people incentive to invest and to, you know, they'd have incentives to be there when we really need them and all that kind of thing. It would uh, uh, really work, but it, it involves uh, changing the way we treat those operating reserves. Now, at the same time this conversation was going on in California, it was going on elsewhere. Um, but they hadn't really uh, sort of thought through all of the details, but I'll just cite it for you here. This is New York, you know, New England, MISO, and PJM. I was asked earlier today by students, has anybody done anything similar to this anywhere else? And the answer is yes. Um, but what they did was make up sort of rules of thumb, um, and they didn't go step back and ask the question, how should, you know, given what we're trying to do, how should we construct this operating reserve demand curve? So they have scarcity prices, and the good news is that demonstrated the technical possibility of doing it. So they're actually running those systems for many years now. They have these scarcity prices included. It interacts with energy and so on. The bad news is that the prices are all too low. Um, and so there, there's a lot of uh, things that need to be done in order to deal with it um, in terms of that we've been discussing here in Texas under the heading of first principles. And I, I won't go through all of them, but the basic idea is to uh, connect to the value of lost load and other emergency actions, to, to look at what the system operator actually does, to look at what the costs really are when you have rolling blackouts, um, to represent the uncertainty of net load changes because the operating reserves are inherently there to deal with an uncertain event. They're not there for, we know what's going to happen and we're it, like we are and we're generating energy now. We know it's going to keep these lights on. The operating reserves is about something that's going to happen later uh, which is probabilistic, so we don't we have to deal with that. Uh, integrating with minimum contingency reserves to deal with cascading blackouts and so on. There's a series of things like that uh, that we would like to be explicit about. And uh, the, the first part of that story um, get, uh, was important because it sort of told us what this operating reserve demand curve had to look like. And the idea was um, at any given moment at the start of the hour, there's some probability that um, demand and generation are going to change in an unpredictable way. This is, this is not the schedule change that we're ramping, but the deviations from the schedule is what we're talking about. And it's going to change in an unpredictable way, and it might get better and it might get worse. Um, if it gets better, it gets better. If it gets worse, we get into the situation where we have to start curtailing load. Uh, and we have to start curtailing load because we got into this worst situation. Now it's very expensive because we have to pay the value of lost load. And so the question then becomes, how much would I be willing to pay for an increment of operating reserves? Well, the answer when you go through this logic is, well, I'd be willing to pay the value of lost load times the probability that I'll need it at the margin, right? Because that's the... That's the expected value of the cost, and that's the, the value that I get from this operating reserve. And that's what this curve traces out. And, it, and there are two interesting things about it. One is it doesn't go, all, even though I'm assuming the value of loss load is $10,000, it doesn't go all the way to $10,000 because, well, uh, the probability distribution, things might get better. <laughs> you know, so it's, it, it, so it's gonna, and if they got better or worse 50-50, that number would be $5,000. But it's, it's, it's biased a little bit because of the expected changes in the means and all that kind of thing. And then the second is, it, unlike these operating reserve demand curves that we've seen elsewhere, it, it's, it doesn't have a cliff where you, you, know, you come out, where we get to the requirement, then it goes to zero. So this tapers off gradually and gradually, and it's, you know, it goes all the way out, to, you know, all the way out there. Right? So it's defined in principle the whole way. Um, and that simplifies the problem a lot. You're not sitting around you know, trying to estimate what's the right cliff and what's the right price for each one of the cliffs. Once you tell me that you're doing this, then all I need to know is the value of lost load, and I need to know this probability distribution. And that's a uh, pretty straightforward uh, calculation. And it's actually a very familiar calculation to uh, system operators. They've been doing it for years for long-term planning. The only difference here is that in, we're not doing it three or five years ahead. We're doing it an hour ahead. Uh, where we have a lot more information. And so that uh, makes that problem a lot simpler. Um, the, the second part of those, those principles up there was, uh, I won't go through all of the uh, discussion here, but I'll just use the picture. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, because of the nature of electric systems and the instantaneous response and stability conditions and problems propagating through the network, 
Um, we worry in the electrical system and have forever worried about the, the cascading blackout problem. So this is a situation where, oops, we just lost the largest generator in Texas. It just happened, uh, and when it happened, it happened in uh, a second. Or how long does it take, John, when it goes? Quick, real quick. See, that's, a, that's an engineering term, quick. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and then that uh, electrical system out there starts responding very quickly, too. Uh, and you've got milliseconds, and, and things start happening, and then it starts cascading throughout the whole system. And if you're lucky, uh, and you had some excess capacity, and the system is stable, then it dampens down and dampens down and dampens down, and John keeps his job. And if you're, not, and if you're unlucky, it doesn't dampen down, and Texas goes out. And John keeps his job because we're desperate for him to get it back. So, it's a, so you don't have to worry, John. You have job security. <laughs> okay. But uh, that cascading failure problem is a serious problem. It's real. It's very much. And the way that the system has been run for a very long time is to have what are known as contingency constraints of various types. And one of them is contingency reserves. And, cont and, the, and the way I'm trying to distinguish here is contingency reserves are like that 3% in that previous uh, graph. You say, when you get down that low, then we're going to start rolling blackouts, controlled blackouts, so that we won't have an uncontrolled blackout. So we're going to take neighborhoods and shut them down and then rotate that around and so forth in order to get back above so we have that minimum number of reserves. And uh, we have to do that in order to protect against the really bad event that could happen, which could bring, uh, sh shut down the state of Texas, and we don't want that to happen. So that minimum contingency level is what's referred to here as X. Uh, and conceptually, what the, how that interacts with this conversation about the operating reserve demand curve is um, when I did the picture previously, I did it against uh, zero here. And so when you ran out of it could get better or it could get worse. And what I'm saying now is that now you have to integrate it with these contingency reserves. The base is not zero. The base is the minimum contingency reserve. Because if you get below the minimum contingency reserve, you're going to start curtailing people. And when you curtail people, it's obvious that the price should be the value of lost load. Because you're involuntarily curtailing them and you're leaving other people on, and they would be willing to pay the value of lost load not to get curtailed. And so you should be charging the same price to everybody. So when you get into that situation, that anchors the price for us. We know it should be the value of lost load. And when you're above that minimum contingency level, you have this uh, curve shape of the picture that we talked about before. So when you look at these pictures and you look at this, the, the, the study, is, I, I'm sure you all study the uh, PUCT tariffs, right? I mean, the public, you're all doing this on a regular basis. When you look at this, you will see pictures that look like this. Uh, and that's where it comes from. The minimum contingency is the first step. And then you have this gradual operating reserve demand curve fading off uh, in the terms that go like this. Um, now you can extend that idea, and they have here in uh, Texas to and other places, uh, New York and such, essentially a nested model. And basically the idea here is you have some reserves that are already running and synchronized, sometimes called spinning or responsive reserves. And these are things which can come on really fast. And, uh, and they can be there to deal with the problems right away. Then you have other reserves that are they're kind of around and they're ready to go, but it might take them 30 minutes uh, to get up, in, up to speed. And um, they're valuable, and we want them too. And then you have other reserves that are out for, you know, they're disassembled because they're repairing the machine. You know, they're not, the capacity is not available. Um, but the spinning reserves um, are more valuable than the 30-minute uh, the, the reserves. To, and... Um, the values are nested. So the, whatever benefits you get from 30 minute, you also get from spinning, and you get additional values from spinning. So you can construct essentially an operating reserve demand curve uh, notionally for each one of them, and then the total for spinning is the sum of the two. Uh, and the, and the non-spin has its own. And the fact that there are two of them is important for what I'm going to talk about later. So that's, that's why I'm going through this sort of a little bit more of this detail. Uh, but this is easy to do, again, and this is, this is already familiar, and people are doing this uh, elsewhere. Um, now a little bit of the, uh, the mathematics about how uh, this is being implemented or uh, proposed to be implemented. Uh, and the basic idea is to take some interval, uh, which in practice we're taking to be an hour, and then to say, in the hour ahead, we're going to have 
two kinds of reserves and two kinds of problems. And then uh, in the first interval, we can have uh, events happen. We need stuff right away. And then in the second interval, we can have more events happen, but we can respond to that more slowly because we'll see them coming and then we'll be able to use this 30-minute reserve. So it breaks up into this two-step story. And when you have that uh, two-step story, you can then do, you can derive the value of the operating reserve demand curve in this first interval and, the, and in, in the second interval, which is the sum of the two, the graphic that I showed you before. And the formula looks like this. And what's, in, what's important about it here that will be relevant later is that when you go and simplify all of this about the loss of load probability times the value, uh, the scarcity value and such, the value of lost load times the length of the interval, uh, is that the price that goes for the responsive or spinning reserve is equal to the non-spinning price plus something else, which is the probability that you have events taking place in this first uh, interval over here. And that separability is actually important, uh, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in a moment uh, and come back to this picture. Um, now, this, this idea, uh, and doing this for Texas, has been studied at length by the people at ERCOT. Uh, this is the proudest publication of my life. I'm actually, uh, so I go around and I show it everywhere because this is the cover sheet from the study that was done uh, here in Texas to simulate all of this and see what it would look like. And it was input to the discussions of the PUCT. And you look down here and it says, who is the author? In, and it says, William W. Hogan and the ERCOT staff. So this is just like when I went to the Cal ISO. I said, who's going to put their name on this? And they said, well, you're the only one with tenure. So. <laughs> but uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, they did all the work. Uh, and all I did was kibitz over the phone uh, when this was done. And it's a, it's a very interesting document, and I encourage you to go uh, read it. Now, um, uh, so that, that's the operating reserve demand curve idea. It's a real-time operation. It interacts with energy and prices. It's got all kinds of very, very attractive properties. Um, and, and now, and, now and, and, and as I explained to the commission and others, and so this is a good idea no matter what. And, and, I, and, and I've written about this many times over the years because the problem I always ran into when I went to PJM or other places where they were trying to fix their capacity markets was, I said, you should do this, you should do this. And then they would say, well, yeah, we understand theoretically that's a good idea, and it probably is a good idea, but we're busy. Um, and uh, we've got to fix this capacity market first, and then after we fix the capacity market, we'll fix the scarcity pricing. And I kept telling them they got it backwards. <laughs> they, they, should, they should do the scarcity pricing first and the capacity market later. But the other thing I kept reminding them is that these are not mutually exclusive. Uh, you, 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 don't, you don't have to choose between them. Better scarcity pricing is a good idea, period. If you don't have a capacity market, you definitely need it. If you do have a capacity market, you need it, then it'll help because it'll make it easier to do the capacity market part of the story. So this is a very uh, good idea. Um, but it does raise the question, uh, which is now being discussed here in Texas, about whether this is enough. So uh, would it eliminate the missing money problem uh, in theory um, and, uh, uh, and in practice, and would you need to do anything else uh, beyond um, having uh, the scarcity pricing? And the answer is, uh, this is complicated, okay? So the first thing is that uh, posing a choice between capacity markets and better scarcity pricing is a false dichotomy. So that's the point I've already made, which is don't get caught in that trap, which is we either have to do this or do that. Uh, that's not true. Um, and Texas has made a decision to go forward with the operating reserve demand curve, which is a good thing. And there, Texas, is, the PUC, is having a continuing discussion of what to do about capacity markets. And because of events here in Texas which have nothing to do with the operating reserve demand curve, basically new estimates of demand and new estimates of capacity and a lot of other you know, things that are exogenous to this, um, there's more time. So the, the, the sense of urgency about the capacity market has been uh, diffused a little bit, and it, but uh, that event will come up later. The second issue is that the resource adequacy uh, issue in this capacity market story depends on the planning standard. So uh, w one of the difficulties everywhere in the United States when we have these conversations is that the reliability standards that were handed down from the mists of time uh, through the system operators um, 
have, as best we can tell, no foundation. Um, the, they were adopted as a matter of convention a long time ago. Uh, people thought they sounded reasonable, and then they became encrusted in stone, and now nobody can explain why they're there, but they're there, and everybody's afraid to go change them. Um, uh, and the standard it, it often expressed is one day in 10 years, meaning different things to different people and in different regions, but loosely speaking, uh, we only want to have rolling blackouts for w once in 10 years, an event where we do rolling blackouts. Now, there are a lot of reasons to think that this doesn't make any sense, um, and uh, it, it's particularly the case that uh, this applies to generation and high voltage transmission, which produces 5% of the or maybe 10% of the occasions where you have rolling blackouts. Most of the problems are on the distribution system, which we're not even talking about. So people, when they read the newspaper and they say we had a, you know, we had a problem here today, it's almost never the problem they're trying to solve through this. It's a completely different problem. So it's, it, it, at a minimum, uh, we are all, uh, because of the changes in the, way, in the nature of smart grids and smart meters and smart demand, we're going to have to address this problem. Because one of the implicit assumptions in this one day and 10 year standard is that demand is completely inflexible, uh, which it's not. And as it becomes more and more flexible and more and more adaptive, we get more and more tangled up in our own arguments to say, well, we're going to treat this demand like it's generation. And then we're going to count it as uh, actually generation to go against the demand. You know, and, it's a, and the language gets perverted in this process. We need to have a serious conversation about what standards we want to apply and how we should think about them. And uh, this is a conversation which has been recommended by many people. I, 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 the, I always go back to Mike Telson, who did his dissertation at MIT in 1973, I think it was, uh, when he wrote essentially the same thing. But if you want to read the same arguments done better with much better graphics, um, you can go to this report here that was just produced for the uh, PUCT. This is done by the Brattle Group and there's people here on estimating the economically optimal reserve margin uh, and, uh, in ERCOT. And um, they are, that document is terrific and it's going to have a big impact on the whole country because they lay out these issues very clearly. They say, look, here's how to think about this problem. Uh, this standard doesn't make, mean what you think it means. Uh, the economic standard is completely different. Here's how different or similar they are. So it, it gives a lot of information. It's extremely helpful, and I hope it's going to have a lot of influence, and Texas, to, to its credit, is in the lead of trying to address this problem. But when that pr conversation comes to an end, uh, we're going to get to the situation I described here, which is the justification of the planning standard would depend more on a more nuanced argument for what market failure that goes beyond suppressed scarcity pricing. In other words, we want to have a reliability and resource standard which is more than just what would be produced by good scarcity pricing. Because we're going to have good scarcity pricing because we've got the operating reserve demand curve. But we might want something in addition, and it, and it would have to be uh, and, and it could be, and there are reasons why this might be true. So let me just give you one uh, such reason. And we could have a list of these. And that is all of these calculations that everybody's doing about reliability are based on our models of the electricity system. Um, as the electrical engineers here know, these models are approximations of the real electricity system. They're not perfect. Right? They're pretty good, but they're not perfect. And it would not be unreasonable for a risk-averse regulator to say, I would like to have a little margin of safety uh, to deal with the failures of the models. Um, so that's not a calculation you do within the model, because we, we're doing that. That's how we calculate all these reliability numbers and everything else. That's how we calculate the operating reserve demand curve, you know, so we're assuming we know what we're doing. Uh, but the margin of safety argument is kind of, well, I'm nervous. And I want to do a little more because um, I'm worried about that. And, and that would, that's what I call a nuanced argument that says you want to, you know, want to put in a little bit more uh, protection. Um, and if you do that, uh, there are a couple of ways to go. And this is the, what I hope will become, uh, you know, this is the part that's more speculative, but what I hope will be uh, discussed at length here in Texas. So one way to go is the capacity market the forward capacity market. And that's discussed at length in this Brattle report. You can read about that. Um, but it's not at all obvious to me that that's the only choice. Uh, so, uh, and what you could do is you could go to energy-only spot markets, and you could say, look, we could tweak the spot markets 
to give an extra margin of safety in the spot market that provides the incremental incentive and the incremental revenue, and we don't need to go to the capacity market. And there are a lot of advantages to thinking about the problem that way because capacity markets are extremely difficult to do at all, uh, and so far they turn out to be uh, extremely difficult to do well. Uh, so we don't, and not that I'm not saying I know how to do it better, I just, it's just a very hard problem. Uh, and if you could avoid it, you might want to do what they do in Chile, which is to kind of tweak the, uh, the spot market a little bit more, uh, but do it in a, in a somewhat different way. And broadly speaking, there are two ways to do that. One way is to have uh, high or no offer ca caps in spot markets. And this was the direction that the energy only market in Texas was taking. Um, and it's the, uh, uh, the way Alberta has gone. Um, uh, and the problem with that approach is that it requires generators to exercise market power in order to get high scarcity prices. And I don't think that's uh, politically sustainable. The other way to do it is through higher scarcity prices. And the idea is to tweak the operating reserve demand curve. And um, what I'm calling here the augmented operating reserve demand curve. And basically there are three tweaks that we, that we could do in order to give us that extra margin of safety. Uh, one is to increase the value of lost load above our best estimate. This is a fuzzy number, so it's not like we have a precise estimate of that number. Um, but if we could increase the uh, value of lost load, that will raise the prices and provide additional revenue and additional safety. I don't think that's a good idea in particular because it will get, create complications when you actually do get to the situation where you're supposed to be applying the value of loss load because then you'll say, well, that number's actually too high and we don't want to apply it, then it'll be inconsistent and people will know it's inconsistent and they'll start gaming it. So I, I don't think that's a good idea uh, and uh, I don't recommend it. The second is to change X, this minimum contingency level. That's also a little bit of a fuzzy number. We could, we could fool around with that a little bit, but you don't want to do it too much, but you have the same consistency problem. Once you set it, then you have to act as though it's real, so that when you get below that level, you start curtailing people and doing all the things that you have to do uh, that ca cause these high values of lost load. And if you're not prepared to do that, then you shouldn't try to tweak this uh, operating reserve demand curve by changing X. And that comes down to the last one, which is the loss of load probability. And actually, I think this is the way to go because it's actually targeted at the problem you're worried about, which is an extra margin of safety because of the uncertainty, because we're not quite sure uh, what the, uh, the uh, real situation is going to be. And the basic idea here would be to um, shift the operating reserve demand curve to respect at some times and to some degree. I don't know how much, but what I did was here was just to illustrate uh, the red line would be if you shifted the mean one standard deviation. So as a, you shifted the mean of the distribution one standard deviation, you end up with a much higher operating reserve demand curve. The green line is two standard deviations. Um, I wouldn't go that far for either one of them, but what they do indicate is that this kind of a tweak would have a big impact. You know, this, is, this would be a lot of money uh, involved in this situation here. Uh, and uh, it's something that uh, could be done uh, uh, in an easy way. I won't go through the explanation because I don't have full time, but just to say what I recommend doing here is actually doing this only for the part that deals with the uh, non-spin uh, because that's what you're really targeting is just availability of generation. You don't want people incurring the costs of spinning unnecessarily for this because that's not what you really need. So if you only do it for the non-spin part, you shift that part of the curve. It also shifts the other one because it's additive, remember? That was the part about it being additive. So, but you keep the differential between spin and non-spin the same so you don't change the incentive uh, to turn the machine on and actually making it spinning so you don't get the efficiency loss when you're doing this uh, uh, cautious uh, story. And that's what the, uh, the, the, the point was here is that the difference between the responsive and the non-spin is going to be the same as it would be even if you didn't do this uh, because you're just shifting the, the non-spin. And then finally, the last chart, um, this is something that we're discussing. Uh, you could do this all the time um, or um, there are lots of situations where system operators start getting nervous uh, and they start taking actions that are not quite curtailing load but they're getting ready because uh, they worry about what's happening, the demand is higher than they thought and so on. And what you could do is have selective application where you only did the shift of the augmented operating reserve demand curve during periods when you were 
thought you really did have a problem, which would target this issue of having an extra uh, margin of safety. Um, this is, a, as I say, something which is under conversation. I get asked uh, lots and lots of questions about this over the years, and so I long ago just prepared a slide that has all the answers, and I'll just leave that there for you, and you can uh, read it if you want. that the Energy Policy Group at the LBJ School of Public Affairs co-sponsored this event. If you guys could just raise up your hands. Yeah, and there was a big group here, not a big group, but you know, there was about uh, eight or ten students. High quality group. Earlier, high quality group mm -hmm. that had a one-on-one -on -one interaction with, uh, with Bill right before the start. Carson. Questions? Um, I assume this idea augmented uh, ORDC has been implemented in ERCARD. Uh, any evaluation work has been done with the findings for that? Uh, the, the, it hasn't been implemented yet. It will be implemented June 1st, I believe, is the uh, uh, target date. So you can get the s simulation studies. Those are public record. Right. And you can go look at the numbers. And, and basically the numbers are, this matters. So it will make a significant contribution to the problem but it's not clear that it's going to be enough. That's a, that's a separate issue. So you get into this augmented uh, uh, ORDC question. What's the market clearing price in that case? Uh, well, it depends on what assumptions you make, but uh, we're talking about, as I, you know, the numbers would uh, be in the range of maybe $5 uh, to $10 a megawatt hour on average higher over the year, depending on choice of parameters. So do you, when you guys were doing this analysis, did you think at all about timelines to help out resource adequacy as far as in order to get any sort of funding to build a project, we got to go out and as resources go find uh, banking institutions that are going to help us get this money to pay it. And this is kind of an abstract concept to somebody who's not, I don't know, I, I think it's a great idea and it's going to do well, but it's kind of an abstract concept to these people who may not have as good a background in energy marketing. I'm just curious if, you know, saying we want to fix this resource problem in five years, ten years, that they might need to see some sort of, you know, physical backing. Like I've seen the back casting that they've done, that's great, but is there any thoughts of how long this would help out in the adequacy problem? John. Well, the, uh, uh, it's, it's a legitimate question. It comes up all the time. The first place is that uh, compared to what? So um, this is about the fastest thing you could put in place. Uh, right. So in that sense, the answer is it's better than anything else uh, in term, on, on, this, on this dimension. Putting in a formal capacity mark would take a lot longer time, and then it would be dealing with forward things that were multiple years ahead. So we're talking about multiple years down the road before it starts actually impacting prices. Um, the, uh, we have the experience in Alberta where they have done an, uh, not an operating reserve demand curve, but they use this uh, uh, unilateral market power, and that's their policy, and they let people do it. And the prices have gotten, and that's a real-time price. So they see a real-time price, and we don't know, and there's no commitment that we're going to do it next year or anything like that. And that policy of having that real-time price has produced it has existed contemporaneously with no missing money problem and enough investment taking place. So, so that's that's happening there. Now, I didn't say it was causally caused. There's a lot of things, moving parts there going on in Alberta, but at least we have the experience there. Here in Texas, you have Panda Power and others. I mean, there's what 2,700 megawatts of new plants uh, coming online uh, over the next six months or a year or something like that. So people are investing in Texas um, and. I don't know whether it's caused by this, or, but uh, clearly there's, and then there are other people who think the people who are investing in, in these plants are crazy um, and because they misestimated what the prices are going to be, and that's what's a, what are called markets, you know, because that's always true. People have different views about these things. So I, I think um, 
I mean, I'm not, I, I wouldn't guarantee uh, this will happen, but, uh, but w w what we, when we have seen markets change and conditions change and expectations about what was going to change, the problem we have had in the past is not that the markets and the banks and the investors reacted too slowly. It was the opposite. Um, as they, re they overdid it and they invested. So in New England, we had this big expansion of gas capacity and then it imploded when the uh, gas prices went up and the, these planes weren't economic anymore. Um, and they overinvested, but the investors, not the ratepayers, uh, took the hit, uh, which is a big difference from the past. So I think that the record is is that uh, if anything, uh, bankers and investors are too optimistic, not not, not uh, too cautious so, in the aggregate. Yeah, so. this, you know, the one uh, heard a little bit of feedback from some people we talked about, and they were just kind of there's a couple people that were a little curious that making sure that you would actually capture the pricing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think uh, the record is that uh, people respond to incentives, and uh, when the incentives are good, they'll do well, and when they're not so good, they'll respond to those too. But they'll respond. I don't think. I think people sitting and waiting for ten years before deciding whether or not this is really going to happen is not a high probability. So, yes, sir. I had I had a couple of comments. So first of all, I'm I'm um, I'm interested to see how do you see the electricity market being different, say, from the real estate market. In the real estate market, we see booms and busts. There is a delay in building houses. There is a delay in building apartments. So there is always people caught having built that extra apartment when the recession hits. This missing money problem is it just an issue that a few years ago we had a recession, so the demand for electricity went down. So they're not going to recover those, um, uh, the, the cost of building them. And uh, do we really need to worry about that? And then the second comment was, when it comes to the um, operating margins, what are your thoughts about using interruptible contracts so that we can tailor the um, reliability of the system to each user? rather than having a margin for the entire market? Uh, so the first one is about uh, booms and busts, and uh, is this a real problem or are we just misreading a bust <laughs> when the prices were too low? Uh, it, it's an argument you hear. I, I think um, there are, uh, there's been a lot of analysis of this, and I think when you go through the litany of all of the things that system operators do to affect prices, pretty rare do they ever make a choice that makes prices go up. Uh, they're always doing things which make prices go down. So there's a systematic bias in the system, which is suppressing prices, and you can see it quite clearly. And second, the numbers are very big and have been big for a long time. So this 50% of the cost of what you need to justify new investment is pretty uh, uh, impressive. Um, actually, if you go back and you look at the California energy crisis, and you look at a f uh, and you take a five-year period. Now, remember, prices went up enormously for a couple of year, year and a half in California. If you take a five-year window that includes that uh, crisis, um, the, uh, a new uh, 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 peaking generator would not have covered its fixed charges uh, over those five years. So even when you had the biggest run-up in prices that we saw, you wouldn't have covered uh, uh, this kind of thing. So I, I think this is a, uh, a real problem and one that needs to be addressed. The, uh, now, interruptible contracts, we actually do have things like that that are embedded in the system. Uh, we were talking about it earlier today, demand response and, and, and that sort of thing. And Interoc does this kind of thing. And um, I mean, that's basically what Interoc is business is, is going around and getting, we, we, they don't call them that, but, that, but it's the same uh, operational thing. People will think up all kinds of creative ways to do this. That'll be terrific, good, I'm glad to see that. And I want to make it worth their while. And the way we do it worth their while is to get to scarcity pricing so they do it when we really need it. <laughs> you know, and that's, uh, and uh, as opposed to having a long-term negotiation about what's the fixed charge for the renewable uh, interrupt or the demand side interruptible contract and then trying to figure out how to make sure they actually deliver when I really need it. Uh, what I want to do is get the prices there so that they make money when they really, uh, when we really need it. And I don't know when that's going to be. So I want to get the real-time prices uh, Every five minutes, right? Yes. 
time as you've seen things go from regulated world to, uh, at least in some places, unregulated. Do you think that a uh, younger generation of people or people who didn't come up with the big regulated utilities are thinking about these problems differently? Like in the sense of you're talking about there's, you know, there's plants getting built, and if there's missing money, that doesn't make sense. So they, I don't think they're just dumb, right? It's a level of like risk taking that you're interested in. And so my question is, is do you think that there's some sort of generational change when people come out of the old world into this wild Arcot world? Well, um, I'm the last person you want to ask about generational change. So I don't, the, um, the, uh, I guess even, I guess generational. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, uh, my experience has been is that uh, the, elect uh, the reliance on markets and the notion that you can have innovation and creativity and you don't need top-down planning in order to make things is uh, an easier to sell to uh, people who are more familiar with the technological revolution than others. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, a big problem with them and everybody else is not understanding that electricity is different uh, and there really is something about it that requires a little bit of top-down coordination and control, not a little, but a fair bit, uh, and it's absolutely necessary. It's not uh, optional. So um, the electricity system situation is uh, complicated. Uh, that's why I like what's going on here in Texas, and I like uh, participating in this conference where we step back and say, "What you know, what are we tr what are we trying to do here? You know, what is the you know how does this work, and how do we get these incentives right?" And and then we, uh, John, we were talking about a particular case today, and uh, we had a debate about whether or not this was doable within the existing software. But I was making the brilliant argument that. Uh, it didn't matter whether you could implement it in the software at the moment. It was a good idea to, to figure it out from first principles. So you knew what you were trying to do. And then when you start dealing with the actual limitations of the software, so you wouldn't make compromises you didn't need or you would think about how to fix it because you would have a, a, a standard that you could use to, to do that. And I think that's going on here uh, very much. And I think that's a good thing uh, in Texas. So, so I, I think uh, the younger generation, I guess, uh, is uh, terrific and wonderful and innovative, and uh, I'm a big fan. And I'm a grandfather, you know. You know, being a grandparent is the only highly rated thing in the world that's not overrated. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you uh, in April. I'll see you in April.